Welcome, Dr. Suzanne Fensky. I'm just going to introduce you briefly. Um, Dr. Fensky is an OBGYN, although may, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you just gynecology now or are you still doing both? Just gynecology. Just gynecology. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Gynecologist and integrative and functional medicine specialist. Tara MD is her, her, the name of her practice, an innovative New York City based integrative and functional gynecology practice located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, my hometown. Terra MD is a practice that strives to give patients exceptionally well-rounded care that keeps them at the center. Welcome again. I have to tell you, um, I, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but is, is your practice, would it be considered sort of a boutique practice? Mm -hmm. probably yeah. yeah 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 and it and what I really love about it and will come visit um you have I believe is it monthly uh sort of events where you home in on a specific topic welcome guests welcome other clinicians perhaps and deep dive into something in your space yeah, I love bringing women together that are, you know, other specialists uh, uh, and, you know, other other speakers, other just women doing beautiful, amazing things coming together to talk about ourselves, our health and perimenopause and menopause. Great. Terrific. I, I look forward to joining one of these weeks. My first question to you, as I told our community guests who are here with us is, uh, what is considered abnormal bleeding? Yeah, great question. So a normal menstrual cycle is considered getting uh, a bleed every 21 to 35 days. And on average, usually the bleed lasts about five days. It can last up to seven days, but mostly five days. So if the bleed is going on longer than that time period, that's abnormal. If you're periods are coming more frequently or further apart than 35 days, then that would be abnormal too. Okay. So I want to actually get to much of what came up, but we'll sort of be fluid, if you will, for the yeah. next 30 minutes or so, um, because they were really good comments and questions. I'm going to go back to the beginning. One of the things that I had said when I said I wanted to ask you this question first is, when I was menstruating normally, and I'm still getting a period, I'm only about six weeks from my last period and I'm 53. And we were joking about having a, uh, an app that, you know, like when you're in perimenopause and things start getting wonky, your app <laughs> might as well tell you, I don't know what to tell you. You know, this, I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't make sense of this for you. Um, someone. In yeah. The I mean, right now, right now the apps tell me like, you know, are you, are you pregnant? Yeah. Like, I don't think so. <laughs> There's gotta be other options here than just being pregnant. <laughs> I, know. I feel like I've disappointed mine somehow, you know, I'm not, I'm not up on it anymore, but, but, uh, someone in the community had mentioned that she has, you know, she feels like particularly anxious about sort of being prepared because, mm -hmm. you know, in the event that she spots or bleeds and, and this kind of thing. And um, so that comes up for her. But one of the things I said was my period when I was getting it regularly was I was told sort of long, like I, I'd have a 10 day bleed and then, mm -hmm. you know, another two and a half weeks would go by three weeks and I'd ramp up for another. So when things are already a little wonky for you, you think, you understand for X amount of years, and then you're in perimenopause and they seem even stranger, how do you really start to make sense of, you know, duration of bleed, I guess, if you will, for now? And am I using correct language? No, you're doing great. I, I would say that, you know, 10 days, I would have said you're having abnormal bleeding, that this is not really? normal. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Like I huh. said, it's, it's usually about five days for most women. Mm -hmm. um, anything more than seven days is abnormal. Interesting. Okay. So, so then if you have something abnormal to begin with, and then it mm -hmm. shifts into something else, how do you even know how, uh, you should, you just assume that things are abnormal once you're in perimenopause? 
Yeah, I think you have to base it on what you historically have been. You know, we're also individual. I have women yeah. who, who normally had 22, 23 day cycles. I have women who normally had 34 day cycles. So if yeah. there's a change from what your norm is, then these are signals that there's a change in hormones for us or a change in something else, right? Anatomically. Okay. Um, before we get back to the questions, I just want to bring up something that someone said that she bled for seven months and became anemic and it was a crime scene type of bleed. And I said, you know, yes, I remember working with a woman who said she'd come into work every day and say, I'm hemorrhaging, I'm hemorrhaging. And she was, you know, high functioning and fine. But I, she said it was like an excessive amount of, of bleeding for a really long period of time. Now, this person here in the community said that um, she had to stop taking hormones that her doctor had said that HRT was sort of the trigger for this kind of bleed, which I'd never heard. It's very interesting. And she ended up um, needing a DNC. She had fibroids that were quite small, but they had gotten larger from HRT. So that's a lot of information, but can you unpack this piece a bit for us, for anyone who kind of might be experiencing heavy bleed, maybe a history of fibroids, this kind of thing? Yeah, so first, uh, fibroids tend to grow during this time. So in our 40s is when we tend to have the fibroids grow. Now, 60% of women have fibroids, they're quite common. Um, but estrogen is really what feeds the fibroids. And during perimenopause, you have these fluctuations in hormones, you have low levels of progesterone. So you have sort of this unopposed estrogen state and that estrogen is going to feed those fibroids, make them grow. Though actually, usually it's more due to your own endogenous, right? Inside making of hormones than the exogenous, the hormone replacement therapy, because your hormone fluctuations are much more drastic than the amount of hormones you're taking with hormone replacement therapy. So sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so that's fibroids. Okay. Um, with hormone replacement therapy, you can have some abnormal uterine bleeding with it or abnormal bleeding in general with it, but usually it's due to an imbalance right? An imbalance in the amount of hormones. So too much estrogen, too little estrogen can all cause bleeding for different reasons. And what's best to do in that situation is to really first look with an ultrasound and see what is the lining of the uterus look like? Is this a really thick lining of the uterus, which can signal that maybe there's too much estrogen and not enough progesterone, or is the lining of the uterus really, really thin, which also leads to bleeding, which can be a signal that there's not enough estrogen being used in the hormone replacement therapy. Okay. So, so just to circle back, and actually my first question would be, could you, it, should you have a history of fibroids? Is HRT contraindicated for you or no. not necessarily? Okay. Not necessarily. Okay. The only thing with HRT and fibroids is that there's still the potential that you can have some usually small amounts, if anything, of growth of the fibroids, because it is still estrogen. But if your hormones are balanced with the appropriate amount of progesterone, then in, you're sort of circumventing that issue. Okay. Okay. Um, An ultrasound would be a good tool for diagnosis as to yeah. what's going on with your uterine lining and why you may be bleeding too much or too little. Yes, absolutely. And then also the location of the fibroids. Right. So there are different types of fibroids. There are, I'll use the, the technical terms, but I'm going to explain it too. <laughs> so sure. we say that there are fibroids that are, I, I like to say the uterus is like um, a water balloon, right? So you can have sub serosal fibroids, which are fibroids that are kind of on the outside of the uterus, not in the cavity in the inside, but hanging out on the outside of the uterus. You can have intramural fibroids, which are fibroids that are in the wall of the uterus. And then you can have submucosal fibroids, which are fibroids that actually push into the cavity of the uterus. The ones that tend to cause the bleeding issues are the ones that are either in the wall pushing up against the cavity or the ones that are called submucosal, which are actually projecting into the cavity of the uterus. The ones that are hanging out on the outside of the uterus that are the subserosal don't cause bleeding issues. Interesting. So the person who had brought that up said she had two in the uterus, one inside and one outside. 
So that's yeah. So yeah. So potentially, if her one inside is actually either pushing up against the lining of the uterus or projecting into the cavity of the uterus, then that's the one that's going to cause some bleeding issues. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to get to the other questions here and then get back to 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 the others I have um, in front of me. Um, the same person asks, I want to know why all my friends with heavy bleeds with menopause keep be keep suggesting a hysterectomy i'm not sure maybe she means perimenopause uh and in any case it sounds like there's a suggestion of a hysterectomy to sort of solve this problem yeah it is common there's a few different reasons why doctors tend to recommend hysterectomies mm. there are ways to manage bleeding other ways you know medications and so on hormones but one theory is that if you're thinking about being on hormone replacement therapy um, once you go into menopause, then having a hysterectomy or removing the uterus, and this is not to say the ovaries necessarily, but removing the uterus, then in the future, they would only need to technically, from a, from a uterine safety standpoint, would only need to be on estrogen therapy. They wouldn't need to be on progesterone therapy right. or progestin therapy. Um, a lot of times hysterectomy will be recommended if fibroids are the underlying cause of the bleeding, it's sort of a definitive management tool that's used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, you don't necessarily have to have a hysterectomy and surgery in general should be really selectively utilized only when necessary as a last resort. Sure. Um, to continue with fibroids, someone's asking, do you need to have fibroids removed or do they go away on their own? So they don't go away on their own. Um, you don't necessarily need to have them removed. With menopause, the bleedings from fibroids tends to be gone. That's not an issue anymore. But if you're someone who has fibroids and has more of the, what we call mass effect, meaning that bleeding's not an issue, but the bulk symptoms, you feel mm -hmm. pain, you feel pressure, urinary frequency, a lot of uh, sometimes constipation, or you, you have a really enlarged belly, then the fibroids are going to shrink somewhat with menopause, but they're not going to totally disappear. Okay. Um, Dr. Fenske, I want to just sort of get back to the beginning, if you will. Um, you explained to us what's considered abnormal bleeding in terms of duration, and I assume quantity. Um, if you're sort of, if, you know, if you're commenting that you're hem hemorrhaging or it looks like a crime scene in your in your bathroom or whatever, I'm assuming that is all under the umbrella of abnormal. Absolutely. I mean, to we, yeah, we traditionally say that if you're soaking, you know, a tampon or a pad every hour for two hours straight, then that's abnormal. Um, if you're passing large clots, that's abnormal as well. So, and obviously if you're anemic, like that one person had mentioned that she was, that that's definitely a sign that it's abnormal as well. Okay, I at the risk of being graphic, and I'm I'm gonna go there with you, and I hope that's okay with everyone of watching. Course. If they're not, I, I apologize, and I hope it's not too much. But I do want to sort of get into the nitty gritty. You mentioned clots. I hear this a lot from women that I'm clotting, I'm clotting, I'm clotting. Because I hear it so much, my assumption was this this could be normal. And now it sounds like that it's not is what, where do you land on this? What's the truth? Yeah, that's considered pretty heavy bleeding. If you're passing clots. Now I'll say that if the clots are, you know, dime, penny, nickel size, sometimes some quarter sizes, then that can be normal. But if you're passing clots that are say, for example, I have a woman say the size of my, you know, the palm of my hand, this is, this is heavy bleeding. Okay. So this is an alert to you also that this is abnormal bleeding. Okay. And in terms of color, odor, texture, what should we be looking for within the boundaries of normal? So the, it tends to change throughout the course of our cycle. Usually in the beginning, it's more bright red, and then it gets darker towards the end and even brownish and just staining towards the end too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all normal. The brighter red obviously means that it's more of a fresh bleed. And the darker means that it's more older blood that's now inside the uterus. Okay. All right. And, but that's not necessarily that it's okay that all of that is changing. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, okay. 
let me get to this question and then I'm going to go back again. Okay. Um, this person says, I have very regular periods. I'm sorry. I had very regular periods until I started progesterone maca a few months mm. ago for peri SXS. I'm not sure what that symptoms, means. probably symptoms. <gasps> That's symptoms. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm good. And now I've been bleeding a low amount for a month straight. I'm 48. Any thoughts? Yeah. So a couple of different thoughts I have on this. Um, I would say in this situation, an ultrasound would be very helpful to kind of get a little further, a little deeper into what's going on. Um, so sometimes in earlier perimenopause, progesterone alone works really well. But like I had mentioned earlier and alluded to, if you're on progesterone and now your estrogen levels have changed, right? You're in this state where month to month things can change and what works for you for a period of time may not work for for you another period of time for perimenopause. But if now your estrogen levels have declined, then the lining of the uterus, what, what progesterone does and what estrogen do to the lining of the uterus is very different. What okay. estrogen does to the lining of the uterus is that it proliferates it. It makes it thicker. It makes it more. So if you have too much estrogen and not enough progesterone, then the lining of the uterus gets very, very, very thick and unstable and then bleeds and sheds and you have this abnormal bleeding. If you have the reverse, right? What if what if she has been on progesterone now, uh, but her estrogen levels have gone down. So now she has very low estrogen and higher amounts of progesterone. Then the lining of the uterus actually gets very thin because progesterone makes the lining of the uterus thin. And okay. that's how it works. When the lining of the uterus is very thin, I like to liken it to being a raw surface right? So it rubs it all. It does anything at all. It bleeds easily. It bleeds easily. It's very thin, but it's not stable. Mm -hmm. So perhaps her symptoms now are showing her that her hormones have changed again, right? The, yeah. the, the underlying idea for what she's on right now is that she's not on a birth control pill, right? If you're on a birth control pill, you're turning off your ovaries, you're shutting down your own hormone production, and you're giving a steady state of hormones. When you're on something like what I assume she's on is bioidentical progesterone, then your ovaries are still doing what they're doing. They're going to make estrogen, make progesterone, not make estrogen, not make progesterone. And this might be a sign to her that she's now transitioned to another state. Perhaps her progesterone dosage is too high for her. Um, or if she gets an ultrasound and sees the lining of the uterus is thick, then perhaps her progesterone dose is not high enough for her right now, which is why okay. I say in this situation, an ultrasound would be a great idea to really be able to see what the lining of the uterus is doing and to make sure, make sure that there's no fibroids, make sure that there, there's no endometrial polyps, other causes of bleeding. Okay. Thank you for that. We're going to get back to that. She did comment. Yes. My doctor is now suggesting adding estrogen. Yeah. Um, I want to get back. Good Questions doctor. Good doctor. In. Good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. I, that's helpful. Um, okay. Someone wrote, I had DNC with ablation yesterday, assuming it's successful. Will all symptoms stop or just the bleeding? All symptoms, hopefully she can respond to this, but yeah, I'm looking back to see of, if she of, wrote any other symptoms, but I'm, I bet now that I, so I'm going to, I'm going to start yeah, to ahead. answer it, but Please. if she wants, if she wants to write in more specifically that I'll zero it in, but your symptoms of perimenopause won't change at all. The ablation in the DNC uh, will help treat the abnormal bleeding that was going on and ablations can be very successful at treating the abnormal bleeding and can be a great tool, especially depending on where your age is. If you're close to menopause, then that really can carry you through without having to deal with any bleeding issues. But, oh, I see you responded. Okay, great. Yep. Breast soreness, um, fatigue, et cetera. Unfortunately, no, it's only going to take care of the bleeding issue. Okay. Can you tell us, just step back for a minute, um, a DNC with ablation, without ablation, what, what is that? What might someone expect if they're told this can be helpful to you in your yeah. abnormal bleeding? Okay. So let, let's, uh, let's, I just want to explain it to make sure everyone understands what these two things are. Cause if you mm -hmm. haven't experienced it or learned about it, then you may not know what it is. A DNC is short for dilation and curatage. And basically that's a surgical procedure where a scraping of the lining of the uterus is performed. Um, dilation being that the cervix has to be 
dilated or opened a little bit to allow us to be able to scrape the lining of the uterus. And the point of this is twofold. It could be therapeutic, right? By scraping off excess lining of the uterus, like I had mentioned, then you're getting rid of that cause of bleeding, but it also is diagnostic. So by doing that, you can also get a sampling of the uterus, make sure that there's no precancer mm. or cancerous lesions. Um, if there's polyps, this can be used to treat the polyps too and remove the polyps from the lining of the uterus. So that's what a dilation and curatage is, or a DNC. Endometrial ablation is actually, there's a couple of different technologies that are used, but it's essentially ablating or burning the lining of the uterus. Um, and it takes it down to a certain depth so that there's no more proliferation of the lining of the uterus. It's burnt down so it can't bleed, it can't proliferate. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. That's so helpful. Um, someone mentioned also besides cancer, why would it benefit you to have a hysterectomy, uh, I, I guess, as a, as a solution to heavy perimenopa perimenopausal bleeding? If you have... If you have fibroids that are causing bulk symptoms, pain, pressure, enlarged belly, urinary frequency, constipation, then this is curative for that as well. Um, and if you're someone who doesn't tolerate progestins or progesterone very well, there is a subset of women that really just can't handle progesterone or progestins, uh, but wants to go on hormone replacement therapy, then this might be uh, a tool that can be used, especially if you have an indication like heavy menstrual bleeding to allow you to be on estrogen only therapy. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can ovarian cysts cause excessive bleeding and spotting? No. So ovarian cysts, um, you know, they, they're, they're located in the ovaries themselves, the ovaries and the uterus are, are very different. Actually, even when you're dealing with your menstrual cycle, your ovaries and your uterus have actually two separate cycles involved, period. So ovarian cysts wouldn't cause menstrual bleeding, but they can be a sign of something, right? For example, in a woman who has endometriosis, and again, endometriosis can worsen during this time of our lives too, because of, right. again, the imbalance of the hormones. Um, and if a woman has endometriosis, then endometriosis can cause the excess bleeding and the spotting that happens in the uterus. And perhaps the ovarian cysts are signals because they could be endometriomas, which are really endometriosis cysts, but the okay. cysts themselves do not cause the bleeding. Excellent. Pain, chronic pelvic pain, are these indicators of something going on, assuming you're bleeding abnormally? And forgive me, I just want to sort of kind of like hover a little higher above the conversation because questions were coming in so fast and furious. I don't know that we sort of set the background well enough. Um, if you want to just spend a minute, just kind of what would you share with us about this issue in and of itself? Yeah. And then, and then if we could get into a little bit about pain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, I had this conversation in the other room when I was waiting over there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm so, so glad. I'm so glad. <laughs> so, so when we think about abnormal uterine bleeding, and that's the term we use, we use AUB, okay. abnormal uterine bleeding for all causes, right? Not just related to perimenopause or menopause. Then we kind of break it down and put it into categories. There are anatomical reasons for abnormal uterine bleeding. And we touched on a few. So fibroids can cause abnormal bleeding. Polyps can cause abnormal bleeding. Um, there's also something called adenomyosis or adenomyosis. Um, and that's when the lining of the uterus, the endometrium actually kind of grows into the wall of the uterus. Um, and that can, in and of itself can cause more painful periods, yeah, more sounds, pain with yeah. bleeding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And abnormal bleeding itself too, usually heavier periods mm -hmm. okay. that happen with that. Um, so when you're really looking at a woman who comes in saying that she's having abnormal bleeding, you want to first put her in a category, put her into the reason, the cause of the abnormal bleeding, whether it's a polyp, whether it's a fibroid, whether it's adenomyosis, whether it's endometriosis, whether it's cancer, whether it's precancer, whether 
and obviously at this point, most women would know this, whether it's a, a coagulopathic issue, right? She doesn't coagulate very well. So, um, right. and hopefully if you're in your forties, fifties, by now you would have already known that for other reasons, sure. but you would have had, you would have had a lifetime of heavy periods, not just during this time. Okay. And then we have other categories. So we have, you know, basically ovulatory, right? Which, which is a lot of what perimenopause putting aside all of those, the cause of the abnormal bleeding is. Um, And with that, you get an abnormality in the hormones themselves that can cause bleeding. So what's really important is first and foremost to get to the root cause and figure out why am I having this abnormal bleeding? And then it allows you to really be able to treat it the right way. Okay. Fantastic. So as far as pain, you described one condition where the the uterine lining may be growing into the wall the, of the uterus, the walls of the uterus, which would call cause more pain mm-hmm. um, with bleeding. For some women who may say whether you know I'm bleeding or not, I'm having pain or I'm bleeding a lot or I'm really not bleeding that much, uh, but I have pain every time. What what where do you land on that? So you want to think the adenomyosis, you want to think about endometriosis too. And those are the two most common reasons for painful bleeding. Okay. Okay. Um, Fibroids can also cause painful bleeding. um, Okay. And that would be one thing to think about. But if you're having heavy bleeding period, no pun intended, Mm -hmm. I guess, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, if you're having... (laughs) If you're having heavy bleeding period, then your uterus is going to contract. That's what it's doing to try to stop the bleeding. And those can be really painful cramps just because your uterus itself is trying to stop the bleeding from happening. So this is a weird question, but I'm I'm listening to us talking about normal and abnormal. And I'm thinking, what is normal? And and the reason I sort of want to put a stamp on it is because there, there's so much in the minutia, if you will, there's so much sort of happening with each of us individually. And I think for many of us, if we're feeling okay, and we're sort of doing okay, it's all normal, right? It only seems abnormal if there's discomfort, if there's pain, if, if, our life is somehow impacted maybe by very heavy bleeding. But I also, I think about those people that we so infrequently talk about who just kind of like skate through perimenopause, you know, their period <laughs> just kind of like peters out. It, it, it goes from six weeks to, you know, 10 weeks to 15 weeks and, and then it's gone. And there's like, there's no pain. There's no heavy bleeding. There's no, all of the other stuff that we know and have come to associate with perimenopause. In an ideal world, is that what's normal? And why are some people living that and others just not? (laughs) Yeah, so in an ideal world, that's normal, right? Because what is normal for perimenopause is that you are going to just start eventually skipping cycles and it eventually will peter out, like you said. It is also normal to, um, in the realm of normal, and this is kind of a deep, deep, deep dive, which we're not, we'll, we'll touch on, but in the realm of normal, you can have these um, luteal out of phase events, basically, where you get this sort of second surge of estrogen that happens during the luteal phase. So after, after ovulation, right, you've already technically ovulated and now you're getting a surge again of estrogen during that second part of the cycle we call the luteal phase. Mm. And what can happen with that, if that does happen, and this is, you know, a normal thing that happens with perimenopause is that you can get a shorter cycle or a longer cycle. That's what it can cause and do. So there's, it's funny because in perimenopause, what's normal is different than what it was for us, obviously, in our 20s, 30s, and right. you know, so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and these things, it, it is normal. It is normal to have these sort of random bleeds. Um, it is normal to have this erratic, irregular cycle. Uh, it's by no means pleasant and enjoyable, but mm-hmm. it is normal things. The things you want to start zeroing in on is really focusing in on the bleeding and how heavy the bleeding is, because those are things that are going to red flag to you that something is wrong. 
Okay, terrific, great. Um, thank you for that. I want to get back to a couple of questions here, and then we're going to pivot to help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, someone says, I have what I call spotting, but actually like one wipe dried blood pinkish color and no other bleeding and can go months before anything else happens. Do I consider that spotting? Okay, so I'm going to assume again, and she can text in or, yeah. or she, whatever she thinks. I'm going to assume that means that otherwise she's not really getting a regular cycle. I, um, I'm going to assume that too. Yeah, because she's calling it spotting. It doesn't yeah. sound like it's a lot. It's light in color, no other bleeding. I can go months before anything else happens. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Good, that's a good question. Is that just spotting? Are we calling that spotting or is that considered, it's spotting. considered a bleed? Okay. It's not a bleed, that's spotting. And another thing to consider during perimenopause and obviously in menopause too, is an, one of the most common causes of bleeding can be atrophy. So vaginal dryness, atrophy can cause bleeding. Nice. So okay. again, and this is not coming from the uterus. This is coming obviously from the vagina. So a lot of times when I hear this, when I hear just this like pinkish or a little bit of discharge, or a little bit of spotting, notice it when you wipe or uh, it just a drop is on your, on your underwear. Then a lot of times that's actually caused the dryness that's happening. And when the vag vagina gets very dry, it bleeds very easily too. To that end. And actually the segues a bit into the next question was what, which is what is the average age to stop your period fully, but just connecting the dot between a spot spotting bleeding and the end when, if you are spotting and like, when do you know, how are you knowing if you're calling it a bleed or not, if you're in this sort of, let's call it the tail end of perimenopause and your last, you know, two years, maybe you're not getting a full bleed, but you're getting something. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. what are we calling what, and how are we defining where we are? And then and yeah. finally, what's Usually the average age? And again, this is not scientific, but usually in, in the gynecology field, we say spotting doesn't require a uh, panty liner or a tampon or a pad. Awesome. That's Spot so spotting is okay. like you wipe and you notice it. Um, it might be a drop in your panties, but bleeding is you're required and you put down, you know, either a panty liner, a pad or a tampon. Okay. Awesome. And then thank you for that. And what is the average age that your period will... So in, <laughs> so in our country, the average age of menopause, right? One year, no period is 51 and a half or so. Um, normal is anywhere between 40 and 60. Most women, 45 to 55. Wow. All right. See, that's so interesting because I just turned 53. I'm still, my last period was about six weeks ago and I thought I was abnormal. I thought I was really... And I'm not. Well, you're you're very special, but you're not abnormal. <laughs> yeah, I love that. We're going with that, and we're sticking with it. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Fensky. Okay, let's pivot, shall we, to to help? So we know that that an ultrasound is very helpful diagnostically. We mm -hmm. we can find out what's going on and and why. HRT can cause some of this. Yeah birth control pills would sort of suppress everything. Is that correct? Yeah. But birth control pills can cause abnormal bleeding too. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, 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 and then of course you're an integrative medicine practitioner also. So kind of give us a, the lay of the land in terms of what we can seek out to sort of help. And I, I, I guess I'm also asking what is help? Like, what does it look like? Do, you know, what is, what is it getting us back on a, on a time track? No, it's, it's sort of, um, lessening heavy bleeding. Mm -hmm. is, would that be sort of the primary concern? Yeah. Well, the primary concern would be, for example, that woman earlier who said that she had anemia, right? You, you really want to make sure that you're taking care of those like, that we call the sequelae of heavy bleeding, right? The issues that happen because of heavy bleeding. Um, okay. So the goal would be first and foremost to make quality of life bearable and good. Okay. Um, make sure that your health is not being hindered by the heavy bleeding. You're not anemic. Um, and 
I forgot the last question you just asked, man. Oh, sorry. I know I was on a, I was on a roll. I, I guess I'm just wondering what what's helpful. What what do you offer? What would you suggest to someone coming in your office? And I, I understand, you know, obviously right, you're addressing different issues. So if someone right, has fibroids, that has one solution. But I don't know. I guess for for somebody who's just you know, saying I'm hemorrhaging, I'm hemorrhaging, otherwise fine. What might be a solution to that? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a few solutions, which I think is great because everyone's very unique and different and what their goal is and what they ultimately want for their own body and their health should be considered. So, you know, and uh, unfortunately in the world that we live in right now with social media, I feel like you get very attacked if people offer this or offer that. Um, so I think a that safe is, space. You yeah. Can say anything. <laughs> So I think it's really important that a woman gets heard for what she needs and wants. For example, if you're in perimenopause, but you're say earlier into perimenopause and you know, you really absolutely do not want to get pregnant and that, and you have no active contraception you're being used, there's nothing wrong with necessarily using a birth control pill during this time to help right. with the bleeding. Um, if that's right for you and if that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, other options are another one that kind of might be controversial to some people too, is women will opt to use IUDs during this time to help with bleeding and specifically, obviously progestin IUDs, right? Because the copper IUD is not going to help with bleeding. Right. Um, and if you're someone who has really heavy periods and it's, you know, affecting your quality of life and it's causing medical issues, then an IUD can be very, very helpful in mitigating that heavy bleed that you may have. Um, somebody had mentioned earlier, you can use progesterone too. If you want a more natural, but hormonal, hormonally effective way of doing it, progesterone or estrogen, depending on the cause of the bleeding, whether too thick a lining or too thin a lining can be very helpful during this time as well. Uh, some women will actually just use rescue medication. And there is a medication that's on the market called transemic acid, um, that can be used for just when you actively have the bleed to stop the bleed from happening. Is it an um, oral medication? Or? It's an oral okay. medication. Okay. Yeah, it's, oh, it's I, a, I didn't know that at all. Hmm. Yeah, it's pills that you take three times a day for five days when you actively have a bleed. And it might not be a great monthly thing to use, um, but if you're in it and you're having a heavy bleed, it can be very useful at that time too. Another woman had mentioned uh, an ablation, um, which also can be a resort and a treatment to manage bleeding if that's uh, you kind of exhausted all other options or, um, you have contraindications to the other options, then an ablation can be very helpful too. Timing of ablation is super important. If you're someone who is 40 years old and you're having heavy, heavy bleeding and you have an ablation, ablation probably won't get you to menopause. You're probably going to have regrowth because ablation is not permanent, um, the studies have shown that it can be very effective for about five years. So if you're someone, for example, who's 50 and you're using that, you it might be all you need and get you through. But if you're someone who's 40, it probably will not last long enough to permanently help with the bleeding. It probably is will come it, back. Is it something you can do again or is it or you can only do do once? You could do it again. It's a little okay. bit harder the second time, but you could do it again. Okay. As far as anything, you know, someone out there might be thinking, is there anything sort of like lifestyle stuff I can do anything like that? Does, is there? From a more natural standpoint, if you're, um, if, if cause of the bleeding is more that your body's, you know, not making enough progesterone and your estrogen levels are normal or higher at that point, then lifestyle things just to help, you know, detox and, and get rid of the extra estrogen is that you want to make sure you're consuming enough fiber. Mm. Um, fiber helps get estrogen out of your body. So, and in our country, we tend to be not so great about consuming fiber, yeah. uh, depending on the study you read, our average intake is either nine to 16 grams of fiber a day, when really we want to be more at the 30 to 35 grams of fiber a day. Wow. Yeah. So that's something we all can do. It's good yeah. for, you know, prevention of colon cancer. It's good for gut health and it's good for keeping the hormones more balanced. Um, there are some supplements sometimes you can use to help also with, um, with, with this during that time. Um, but it depends on kind of the cause or the reasoning why right. you're having the bleeding also. Sure. 
Sure. Um, before I get to my last two questions, someone asks, does birth control help symptoms of perimenopause as well as bleeding? It does. It does actually. Um, and you can, you can do birth control in two different ways. You know, if you don't want to be on hormone replacement therapy later on in life, you do birth control to kind of a set certain age. Um, it used to be that women were saying 50. Now the guidelines are saying you can go to 55 on birth control pills and then come off of it and see where you are with menopause and transition to menopause, or you can then transition to hormone replacement therapy. If you really do want to be on hormone replacement therapy and don't have a contraindication. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fenske, is there anything that we should sort of be uh, prepared for when we go into a doctor's appointment about this? And I, I'm thinking, you know, you mentioned anemia, someone mentioned anemia, and I'm thinking about, you know, sort of the symptoms of that, what somebody might not even sort of mention. I mean, you're a physician and, and you know that if someone comes in and says, I'm bleeding heavily, you, I'm sure anemia is sort of top on your list of things to, to look for or test for. But so much of our success when we leave the office is kind of dependent on how well we communicate what mm -hmm. is going on and what our needs are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like to give all of us a, an opportunity to sort of be shored up by a clinician who would say, this is really helpful for me to know things that we might not think about. Yeah. I, th I think that's great actually, because um, I will say that uh, I love when women come to my office, really prepared, really knowledgeable. It just makes the conversation that we can go to a whole other level with things. Mm. Um, I think that first and foremost, and a lot of us are doing this now, but track your, track your cycle, track your, your periods. And there are so many trackers now to use that uh, there's really no reason why not we can track it, but mm. come in tracking your cycle and, and show, show that app to your doctor, your provider, seeing what <laughs> your cycle is looking like. Um, okay. it, take into account and think about, you know, how many pads am I using a day when I'm getting my period? How long is my period lasting for? And be prepared with that as well for the, for the talk you're going to have with your doctor. Um, make a list, make a list of your symptoms that you're noticing that's going on with perimenopause. Because I find that most women actually don't, they come in kind of with the core ones that they're realizing. And then all of a sudden, as we're talking more things will come to mind, more things will come to mind. And it's super important to kind of know every symptom you're having with perimenopause, because it allows really to tailor treatments to work for you best. Sure. Great. Thank you for that. Um, finally, from the community, are you saying, Dr. Fenske, HRT is better than birth control after 50? So they're different. Um, okay. So the hormones that are in birth control pills, you know, A, are synthetic, okay? Not the same chemical structure as the hormones that we, we make, uh, except there is one birth control pill on the market that has a bioidentical estrogen in it now. Um, but more importantly, the amount of hormones in birth control pills are higher than the amount of hormones that we use in hormone replacement therapy. So you don't need to be on a birth control right. pill for a longer period of time. You really only need the birth control pill, A, for the contraceptive benefits during perimenopause, uh, because you don't need to expose your body to more hormones than what your right. body needs. Yeah. And again, you, you, the guidelines now are that you can stay on a birth control pill to age 55 and yeah then transition to hormone replacement therapy, or then just stop completely and see where your cycle is and where you are. Thank you for that. That's so helpful because I know many of us in Perry are offered or suggested a birth control pill and the association we make about birth control pills, and then sort of not really knowing about HRT. It's sort of hard to figure out what do we really need and why would we choose one over another? So that's, that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fenske, what is in store for you next? Where can we find you? And are you accepting new patients? Yes, accepting new patients. Uh, my practice is on 60th and Madison in New York City. And, um, you know, hoping to just keep growing Tara MD and uh, finding more providers that really believe in the same integrative approach that I believe in a 360 approach to all women and all aspects of, of their journey. Yeah. And I then, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
And then um, it's websites, www.taramd, T-A-R-A-M-D.com. And Instagram is Tara MD, the number four women. Thank you. I cannot wait to come visit your practice for one of your evening yes, events. You have I, to come. I, I, I'm <laughs> absolutely coming. Um, and I, I, I just, I can't wait. I, it looks lovely. You are lovely. I thank, thank you. you so much for really kind of getting into the weeds here. This was a lot to unpack and we did it quickly. And there were a lot of questions and comments coming in. Um, thank you, Dr. Suzanne. Thank Pinsky. you. Thank you. I'm happy I found the right room. Yay. <laughs> I am too. And we'll do it again. And thank you to everyone who joined us and, and chimed in, uh, super helpful and, uh, just delightful. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Be well, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Bensky.